When we make a prediction or make a guess, it's nice to know the level of confidence about the solution that we're offering. Say for example a multiple choice test where there's five options. If we've got no idea, then we've got a one in five chance of being correct. But if we have sufficient knowledge to think that our answer may be correct, we might express our confidence as being 80 to 90% or even up to 100% if we're quite certain. To introduce the idea of confidence intervals, let's have a look at a situation where we're at a party and we want to guess the average age of the people that are attending. For our first guess, we might say the average age is 35 and we'd be pretty lucky to try and get it right the first time. For comparison, we'll put the actual age there as 28. We don't know that when we guess, but we'll keep that in mind. Let's create a confidence interval. And what we'll do is we'll create a band of ages, 20 years either side of our guess of 35. We'll call that 20 an error margin. So 20 less than 35 is 15, and 20 more than 35 is 55. And if I was asked for my confidence that the age was between 15 and 55 at the party, I'd be pretty sure that the correct age would be within those values because that band of 40 years is quite wide ranging. Let's now decrease the error margin by 10 either side. So we're now talking about an interval which is 10 years less and 10 years more than our guess of 35. So that means that our range of ages for our guess goes from 25 to 45. Whilst we can see that the actual age still exists within that band, when we make the guess, we don't know that. So our confidence has been reduced. Let's now take it one step further and reduce the error margin either side of our original guess so that we are looking at five years lower than 35 and five years above. Now our guess ranges from 30 to 40. Now if we were to ask people within the party perhaps to do a similar exercise and to guess the average age, but they too only were allowed a five year error margin either side of their guess, we'd probably find that the percentage of times that the actual average was within those guesses would be smaller than if the error margin was 20 years that we had in the original case. So the smaller the interval, the smaller the percentage of times that the actual answer, in this case 28, will be contained within the interval. Now if you've studied normal distributions, you'll know that most things that occur in nature, such as measurements to do with people's heights and weights, etc., are normally distributed. So let's have a look at how confidence intervals might work and we'll examine the standard normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Let's look at the value of zero in our normal distribution, which is the mean. And what we'll do is we'll consider areas under the curve either side of the zero. So we'll make it a symmetrical distribution. If we're going to consider 90% of the area under the curve, what we'll do is we'll look at values which are 1.645 either side of zero. Or in the case of this standard normal distribution, we say it's 1.645 standard deviations either side of the mean, in this case zero. Taking this interval one step further, now let's have a look at a confidence interval of 95%. In other words, 95% of the area under the curve. We can see on the x-axis that we need to look at values which are 1.96 standard deviations either side of zero. If we now extend that area, so we're looking at 99% of the area underneath the normal curve, we're looking at x values which are 2.576 standard deviations away from zero. Now the reason that we've incorporated the normal distribution is that we know that if you make a guess or a prediction and we talk about it as a sample proportion, we know that the greater the sample size, the sample proportions approach a normal distribution with a mean of p, which represents the population proportion, and a standard deviation defined as the square root of p multiplied by 1 minus p all over n. Let's have a look at an example now where we use a sample to do some research and then we determine how confident we are about our result. So in this example we've asked 250 drivers if they've had their car serviced in the last six months and we're trying to set up a confidence interval where we can say well we think 90% of the time the interval that we're presenting here will actually contain the population proportion. So let's start by setting up our normal distribution. We know that we need a p and an n value. In this case, we don't actually have the population proportion, so we'll use our estimate based on our sample proportion, p hat. We know that p hat is equal to 144 out of 250. That's the number of drivers who said that they had their car serviced. 
and we know that n, the sample size, is 250. Our confidence interval is going to be set up on a certain number of standard deviations, which is like an error margin, from our sample proportion, or p hat. And we've expressed it here by saying that our population proportion p is likely to be between two values, the p hat minus a certain number of standard deviations and the p hat plus a certain number of standard deviations. We know from previous diagrams that we saw that for a 90% confidence interval, the number of standard deviations will be 1.645. Let's now actually calculate the standard deviation. Because we don't know the population proportion, we'll use our sample proportion, which is 0 0.576. And we'll put that into the formula along with a sample size of 250. If we do that, we get a standard deviation of 0 0.0313 and we know of course that p hat is 0 0.576. As we said before, we need 1.645 standard deviations either side of our mean to give us an area of 90% for the normal distribution. So if we substitute all those values into our formula for the confidence interval, we find that the left boundary becomes 0 0.5246 and the right boundary 0 0.6274. So what is this telling us? It's saying that if we continue this process, in other words, survey 250 drivers and then determine the confidence interval the same way as we have here, we could say that 90% of the time we'd expect to find the population proportion within the interval that we've found. Let's have a look at our second example now, but this time we actually know the width of the interval. What we're trying to determine is the size of the sample required to achieve this level of accuracy. Whilst we don't know the population proportion in this example, we are told it's close to 0.5. We're looking at a 90% confidence interval, hoping that the margin of error does not exceed 0.03. Now our task is to find the appropriate sample size. If we think back to our original example where we looked at the average age at a party, we had a guess of 35 years and the error margin either side of that was plus and minus 20. So that plus and minus 20 represents a distance from our sample proportion. Now in this example we don't have a sample proportion given to us but what we do have is our formula which tells us that that error margin is k multiplied by s or k multiplied by the standard deviation and that has to equal 0 0.03. So we go to our standard deviation formula and what we substitute this time is 0 0.5 for p the population proportion. K represents the number of standard deviations away from the mean, and so in this case it's 1.645 for a 90% confidence interval. So now it's a matter of solving for n, and we can do that on a calculator. If we go through and solve it, we get n is approximately 751.67. Now given that n is representing sample size, we want that to be a whole number. So the question is, is n equal to 751, or 752, or does it even matter? Do we just round off to the nearest whole number? The best way to solve this problem is to substitute the two n values into our equation shown in purple. 752 is larger, of course, than 751, and if we substitute a larger number into the fraction, the result will be smaller. It's important to note that we want our error margin to not exceed 0.03. We want it to be smaller. So the correct solution is for n equaling 752. We need the larger number if the margin is not to exceed 0.03. So the sample size we need to justify a margin of error smaller than 0.03 is 752.